Hi everyone and welcome to Conversations with Nick Com. We're back in the studio for series two. Um, today I wanted to really cover a topic that was close to my heart, um, which is ADHD, something I personally suffer with or um, have been diagnosed with actually. Um, and I wanted to bring in someone excellent who we could have a good conversation with regarding um, this topic. So today we've got David Levy in from N20 Counselling. Thank you, David. Hi, thank you. David is a therapist um, specialising in ADHD. Um, so today's going to be a great show and we're just going to talk about all things ADHD. We'll probably get distracted um, and see where we go from there. So kind of opening up, David, what, what does ADHD stand for? I mean, literally, it's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, I think the acronym does it a little bit of a disservice, actually. Okay, well, uh, I think it was about 15 years ago, they introduced a slash between D and the H. Okay. So it became Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and maybe that gives you a bit more insight into sort of the duality of it. Typically, people with ADHD suffer with attention deficit, so that, you know, they can't concentrate, they can't focus, they can't remember or listen, or they suffer with attention hyperactivity, which is where the brain becomes sort of overloaded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sort of the number of thoughts that are going through people's heads just feel too much. And that's when they begin to suffer with things like emotional dysregulation and so on and so forth. Very literally, you know, it's that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But in reality, it doesn't even begin to explain what the condition is actually about. Yeah, it certainly... It it, it's, I think when some people get whacked with it, it's like, wow, you know, and I mean, what, what can cause ADHD? Is uh, it's a lot of different factors. There's no actual known scientific thing that we can sort of lump it on. We know that there's a genetic factor. So four out of five children that are diagnosed will have uh, a relative with the condition. So there's certainly a genetic element uh, that's considered that it's possibly an environmental uh, element as well so you know sort of the way that you grow up can potentially affect it but what that may typically mean is that a lot of kids for example display ADHD like symptoms mm. and sort of how they grow up and particularly through puberty you know if they receive the kind of the the things that they need you know you've got a good chance of that stuff kind of just sort of evening out and being okay if the environment is sort of conducive to it to it expanding and growing and then sort of gathering strength then it can certainly do that too um there's sort of scientific studies and i mean in scientific terms it's all relatively recent you know adhd really only appeared as a term as add in the early 80s um where they're sort of looking at things like uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is this part of the brain right here, which deals with sort of emotional regulation and decision making and things like that. Uh, there are studies that suggest that sort of the people with ADHD, their brains are actually slightly smaller in certain areas. There's, there's more gray matter, they call it. Um, there's also things like uh, premature birth is, is a possibility. Um, activity during pregnancy is a possibility. I mean, there's, there's this is quite a variety of factors. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to pin down, which is probably pretty fitting for the for the condition. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know when I was at school, there wasn't any of this ADHD. You're a little shit. Yeah. You know, you're not paying attention. You get sent home, <laughs> slap on the wrist, or whatever. You know, and that that is kind of what it is. We knew about dyslexia, um, and there are some 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 common. There's some certainly some things that are in common, which is hence why it's such an intense diagnosis yeah. uh, from a consultant psychiatrist. But and I recall when, when and it can affect you in other ways because I remember when I was at school, um, I wasn't paying attention, and the teacher was talking about something or other, and I remember putting my hand up to ask a question, and the question that I asked him was exactly what he just said, mm -hmm. um, and everyone laughed. And that kind of really took a, a ripple effect on me later on in life or continuing on from school, asking questions because mm. I thought, well, what if that happens again? I don't want to be embarrassed and humiliated and what have you. So um, I think nowadays it's definitely become better because there are people, the, the teachers or, or other um, professionals within the schools that are kind of trained to kind of spot signs or symptoms, I suppose. There, there are, for sure. Um but there's also a lot 
people that get missed along the way, even now. I mm. mean, I, I suspect you and I probably aren't that dissimilar in age. And, you know, I'm the same. You know, I, I was the naughty kid at school. I was the clown at school. And it was all because the person that I actually was, I didn't have any chance of being able to access, you know. And I, I hear what you're saying. You know, people in that day and age, you know, I started my secondary school in 1990, you know, and they didn't have the mechanisms. But there is also a case to say, well, maybe someone somewhere should have asked if there's a why, mm. you know, why, why is this person acting in this way? You know, they're naughty. Okay. You want to lay, lay that sort of label that gets thrown at a lot of ADHD people when, they, mm. when they're kids, but the question should be why? And, and, you know, when you have that human element, whether it's a, a teacher or, or anything like that, people will get missed. Yeah. It's yeah. just inevitable. Because I always suspected, not since school, but um, I suspected that I had it. Um, when I was training, when I was in the police force, mm. you have to learn from something called white notes, right. which is basically the definition of law. Um, and it's very intricate and it's very in-depth. And I was struggling mm. to retain all the information. And if you didn't get sort of 70 80% every week, you're out. So it was very hard, hence why I started using cocaine. Then I started retaining the information. It was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Um, but my point is um, that it's not necessarily spotted, or, you know, as that child, like you've, you've rightfully said. And, and as I went on, time, um, that I suspected that, that it was there. And it was only to a friend of mine that was a consultant psychiatrist that, that kind of highlighted that. Um, so how did you cope with it until that point? I struggled, I struggled. And I think fortunately, um, as my business grew, I was able to offset and ask my team for, for support where they, you know, where someone was strong, um, that could help me with where I was weak. Mm. So I had people around me and that helped me support my growth. Mm. Um, I mean, not knowing, I mean, looking back on it now, obviously you've got your sort of post recovery phase of your mm. life and everything like that. But when you look back now, are you able to sort of view things through a different lens when it comes to sort of the ADHD experience? Whereas before it may have been sort of this corrosive part of your past that you know, was just part of that self-esteem wearing down. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is about whether or not you're able to look back in your experience now through that ADHD lens and see the way that it affected you in terms of just your self-esteem, you know, and, and all of these other things, because, you know, as you're saying, well, what you're correctly saying is, you know, you sort of, you always thought you had it, but until you're diagnosed and when you, um, especially when you're a young kid, I can't imagine there was anything other than also an element of doubt, mm. you know, and, that doubt can be very, very damaging, you know, it becomes a sort of, well, it could be this, but what if it's just me? What if I'm stupid? Yeah. What if I'm etc. Yeah. And it, and it certainly does. And I think when I got that diagnosis, I actually felt relieved, um, weirdly enough, but I look at it as a superpower. Um, because when I'm interested in something, I have this ability to hyper concentrate mm -hmm. can't go on for a, 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 a very 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 long time but within the time that i'm kind of hyper concentrating i would say i'm more proactive and more productive mm. than other people without adhd but what what type of adhd are you well weirdly enough they actually the, the consultant psychiatrist said i was add okay um so so without the hyperactive part, which would make sense because I'm <laughs> I'm not hyperactive. <laughs> um, I'd be a bit skinnier perhaps if I was. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm not hyperactive. So um, and then there's obviously other um, involvement since then that's saying that the AD is now just ADHD. Um, yeah. So from what you're saying, and I, I think this goes back to what I was saying before about how the term ADHD doesn't serve it. You mm. are hyperactive. 
it's hyperactive of brain, mm. not hyperactive of movement. I mean, it is in some in some cases in some aspects, but <clears throat> excuse me, the the hyperactivity is the mind. It's the driving force. You know, one of the questions that they ask typically of people when they're doing the ADHD assessment is, do you sometimes feel as though you're driven by a motor? And that interesting. Can, and that can be inside or out. You mm. know? So there is a hyperactivity there for you. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear that you're, you're diagnosed with ADD because it's term, as far as I'm aware, they haven't used since, well, it's come out of the DSM. I don't know if you know what the DSM is. No, what's that? It's the manual by which doctors, psychiatrists, et cetera, use as sort of reference for criteria for diagnosis. So for ADHD, for example, uh, there are something like, I think there are nine. That could be very, very wrong, but there, there are a number of criteria whereby as if you fit, I think it's seven of them, then you qualify for that diagnosis. Um, and so I think I had DSM, about 15 of those nine yeah well <laughs> uh, and the DSM which I mean they're only on their fifth edition it's been going since 1980 so it's not something that's updated that often but in 1987 that was when the first mention of ADHD right um, w was given because before that it was ADD with hyperactivity and then ADD without hyperactivity yeah, yeah. and then it just became the combined term but so what would you say are the pluses of having ADHD as an adult as an adult diagnosee or just in general well i think um i think in general really mm -hmm. I mean, in general, what it means is you have some skills that others do not. The ability to hyper, hyper concentrate, or, you know, to sort of hyper focus on things is, you know, it can be a blessing as much as it can be a curse, I guess. You know, it makes us very, very creative, very mm -hmm. resilient. Overwhelmingly, people with ADHD have spent a lifetime building coping mechanisms just to sort of achieve some sense of normality they're incredibly creative people they're very much like addicts you know in, in as much as they're very very resourceful mm. you know and when something is needed in that adhd brain that uncontrollable drive they will find a way to get it by hook or by crook um it's really interesting you mentioned that because comparing myself to my wife my wife doesn't have adhd when a problem happens she will dwell in the problem. When a problem happens, I will focus on so the solution. It's how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? And I suppose, would you say that's one of the, one of the tools that we kind of self-develop? Um, yeah, it is. Um, but it's also one of our failings. Right. At the same time, which is, you know, one of the latest of many contradictions that I'm sure will come up today, you know, that what we're doing is we're not seeking the solution. We're seeking a solution mm -hmm. as quickly as humanly possible, just so that that feeling, which is a very similar feeling to an addict who needs a fix, yeah. you just, you need the feeling gone. And that's what it's really like for ADHD people. It doesn't matter whether or not it's the carefully considered solution. Or right solution or it's best just, solution. It's just, I need it now. Yeah, to take away this. Absolutely. And this is why, you know, there are so many parallels between addiction and ADHD behavior uh, and ADHD people, uh, you know, they're constantly drawn to things like sugar and caffeine, anything that provides that very, very quick fix. Interesting. So why, when they treat ADHD, mm -hmm. quite commonly, a consultant psychiatrist would prescribe an amphetamine. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Has that got... Is there, is there a connection there between why an addict may look or why someone with ADHD may look for a stimulant mm. um, like me with cocaine um, and, and quite commonly with many others? I'm not as familiar with the science of addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, the scientific answer is typically because people with ADHD have been observed to produce less dopamine mm -hmm. and the dopamine production that they have is more quickly absorbed back into the system. So when the brain is stimulated so when we treat with stimulant we create more dopamine and because the dopamine is being artificially created and there's more of it 
it takes longer to be reabsorbed back into the system. So it brings you up to that same level. Mm. I think, and, you know, it's it's impossible for me to say with any certainty because I'm ADHD, but for a lot of people with ADHD, and this is certainly true of me, what I might describe as that high of amphetamines in terms of my ability to concentrate, to rationalize my behavior, to regulate my emotions and, and so on, is fairly typical. All, all that amphetamine does, that artificial feeling of high, is bring me into a level playing field with others. Because I tried many different amphetamines, different uh, and non-amphetamine based drugs, but especially um, the first kind of portico is usually an amphetamine based drug. Um, now, we put this down to me having, su I mean, I've been clean over 13 years now, but such still such high tolerance to stimulants. So when I took the medication, I hit this 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 come down that shakiness you get when when you're when you're on you know in addiction and that that paranoia and what have you and I felt I could concentrate less it, it, it had a complete adverse effect so um, and I tried all all different ones literally all different ones but none of them seemed to work so I'm unmedicated and I found as you mentioned earlier some some coping skills mm -hmm. um, some of which work some of which don't <laughs> um, so what other for people that are in a similar position to me, that have maybe are not taking medication currently, oh, uh, and I suppose for a lot of them, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I suppose there's probably a still huge portion of people that are taking medication that still require further support and help. Where does therapy come into that? What we have with ADHD, and you know, my particular work overwhelmingly is with adults with ADHD mm -hmm. who are stumbling into a, a, a diagnosis, you know, in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, you know, in amongst all of the coping and all of the resourcefulness and all of that is a life of, you know, I said to you before about doubt, mm. feeling that perhaps they haven't fulfilled their potential, you know, a feeling that life could be different they've grown up anxious or depressed, you know, the comorbidity, we call it, mm -hmm. with ADHD is, you know, anxiety, depression, stress, addiction, you know, these things are very, very common. To treat ADHD in isolation is to only really, it's only the tip of the iceberg. And where therapy can come in, particularly with adults who have had a recent diagnosis, is to help process the feelings of grief and the feelings of, anger and sadness and all of these typical signs of some of a loss mm. because there's so much of a life that has gone before which especially if you're like myself i had a very positive reaction to to medication there is a, a sort of a a wishful thinking you know well i'm medicated now and you know what could have school been like is a very very common one yeah you know where people sort of sit there and they go well that explains it all but I've been walking around with this for 30 years. So that's really where the therapy comes in. And if you have a therapist who at least understands ADHD, let alone has it, some therapies also include, you know, just some practical parts of helping people put strategies and tools in place. You know, therapy provides the level of patience that is required that, you know, partners or families often don't have. Mm -hmm. You know, therapy, a natural part of therapy is understanding that failure is almost inevitable. You're going to try something or something is going to get suggested and you're going to come back. And you're going to, well, that didn't work. And your therapist hopefully is going to say, okay, well, we try again. <laughs> you know, keep and going. because they're used to that Absolutely. kind of failure as well, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, my my most, I think the, the thing I hear the most from people that are new clients that I see because of ADHD is some version of, I can see you know what I'm talking about. And, and that understanding it is so, so important because medicated or not, it's essentially you're living in a new skin almost mm. when you get that diagnosis suddenly it becomes you have a framework around which you can make the adjustments 
it gives you some sort of pointers as to where you can and can't do things and names for them, mm. which means that you can then come up with names to counter it as best you can. I think um, I struggle a lot with um, when I get long emails mm -hmm. and the amount of books I've bought at an airport to take away on holiday <laughs> and never read, right? Although I may read the first chapter about 17 times, but the I find that, you know, I, get, I buy a book or I read a book and I get read the first chapter. By the time I finish the first chapter, I'm literally exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time I pick the book up again, I've forgotten what happened in the first chapter. So it makes it very challenging to try and, um, you know, to to move forward. In, and, and it's something... But I find... What, what, what would you suggest would be someone that's in that position... Um, what they could do to perhaps get focused? I think, Nick, you're asking almost an impossible question because I'm not sure that they can do any one particular thing. The only thing you can do is to come up with tools to find some alternative. You know, it's like asking a deaf person, how do you work out a way to hear? Mm. You know, you if if you're reading a book and you can't take anything in, and I'm very familiar with that. You know, mm. sort of having to read and reread and reread. There's no there's no thing I can say to someone. You know, sort of tap yourself on the head four times and you'll remember the main character and why they're there. You know, it might be that you just accept the fact that you're somebody who might have to read the chapter twice, mm. maybe even three times. You're somebody who, when he reads, may need to make sure he's got a highlighter pen on him or some notepad that gives you, as you're going along, you know, you sort of write, okay, well, the main character's name is X, and this is their, their sort of defining characteristic that I've learned, some, something along those lines. I think part of, and I, this is why I was talking about loss before, part of the ADHD experience and part of coming out the other side of the ADHD experience is an understanding and an acceptance that on some level, even medicated, you're not going to be the same. Books, as they are sold in a in an airport, are not sold catered to the ADHD mindset. And I guess you you wouldn't, you know. But it, it, I think it's unreasonable to expect yourself to be able to just do that thing through some tool or something like that. It's just it's and as happen. and as we discussed earlier, you know, you said we are creative. Yeah. We're creative people and we find solutions. And I'll share one that I've come across that helps me in this situation. So firstly, I've given up reading books, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> first thing, because I just get disheartened, disappointed, upset, I can, you know, mm. it, 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 it brings out the worst in me. It's like basically playing a game Monopoly, it brings out the worst in you. Um, so, I do audio books yeah. and podcasts, um, which I love listening to. And for some reason, I don't know how it enters my brain, but it does it differently. Um, and there's also an app. I think it's called Grammarly. Um, there's a few of them. Yes, and, Grammarly. and you copy in, say, a long email mm -hmm. and put it into it, sure. and it reads it out to you. Yeah. Um, Screen readers are very popular. Yeah, uh, it's, Microsoft Word has a free one. Does it really? Yeah. So if you highlight text on Microsoft Word, and you look, I think. Well, I mean, my version of Word might be older, but if somewhere near the top right hand corner, a little play button appears, and it plays. It plays what's written. I mean, it's a robotic voice, but it's better than nothing. Never knew that. Yeah. Never knew that. Um, so one area which. I'm sure quite commonly um, many people suffer with is organization. Mm -hmm. um, this is, especially as a business owner, um, something that is a challenge daily sure. because it, it comes in from literally every possible angle and it is my the hardest thing I find to manage with, with my ADHD. Have you got anything that you could provide us with that could give us some help in that area sure 
my the biggest piece of advice I can give you is simplify. The mm -hmm. simplest solution. You know, I have found with ADHD that a pretty typical experience, maybe you can relate to this, of getting organized is you go, right, I'm going to get organized. And you think, okay, well, how am I going to do that? And you eventually arrive at some kind of idea. And then you spend loads of time thinking about how that idea is going to be structured. And then you start putting that idea together. And then, and so on and so on and so on. And by the time you've got down the road with that, it's so complicated and so convoluted that you've begun to realize that it's probably not suitable for the purpose that you originally intended it to be and you go back to square one and people go around that circle time and time and time again mm. my general rule with adhd people when i when we're talking about this is create something like you are creating it for a child you want to get organized pad and paper write it down you know keep it as simple as possible you need to keep track of a lot of appointments for example that's that's my world all written down only ever written down i tell my wife and you know we do sort of couple support groups and things like that you know that if they're not in diaries if they're not written down they don't exist don't expect it to be remembered it doesn't exist although the wives always remember everything even an Absolutely. argument from 1984 yeah when you know yeah. you didn't pass me the salt <laughs> and you know to borrow a joke from ben elton and yeah the other things I would say, you know, just in terms of sort of simplicity is give yourself a sort of a single area, you know, maybe it's in the house, maybe it's some, just, you know, if you're someone who needs to lead an organized life, I'm a business owner too. Mm -hmm. You have one place where everything goes. And as long as it's in that place, even if you're losing stuff along the way, you know that you have a place where it gets put you know, down the road and it all lives there. And that's a really good point because I think where I could be going wrong is I'm trying to be paperless when I'm better with paper, yeah. if that makes sense. Sure. So I've got, you know, whenever I save a document, I just save it to my desktop, mm. right? Because the filing cabinet's there. I've got the OneDrive folder, mm. but it's the f it's the the sections within the filing cabinet that I struggle with. Sure. And then when I need to go and find something, it's like, oh, what did I put it under? What did I store it under? Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose what I like about what you're saying is that simplifying element is keep it in one place. So I'm trying to do two separate things, yeah. um, which clearly isn't working. No. I mean, I'm very lucky in that my work, the confidentiality of my work mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of the responsibilities of people's information I have is so tight yeah. that actually keeping everything written is a huge tool for me. I'm not true. I mean, I'm registered on some GDPR stuff, but I don't keep anything online. Nothing, not a thing. And it is, it's a system that works for me. And, a, and I suspect it will be a system that works for a lot of people. You know, just yeah. to have that, the simplest, simplest, simplest way of doing things. It's, um, it seems like a stupid question when you put it so easily. Um, <laughs> there are no stupid questions. <laughs> yeah, you're ADHD. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. your brain immediately jumps into, a, it's not just a question of organization. What you're saying in your own head is organization equals paperwork, meetings, people, etc your brain immediately goes into hyperactive mode, mm. which means that it doesn't know what to do with all of that information. So it's sort of like, you know, a tornado gets created and it all gets swirled around and you might be able to focus on one bit of one minute, but then it goes. Yeah. So it makes sense in the moment, but then the next moment it's something else. So it makes total sense what you're saying. I think that's fantastic. I think we've covered... Um pretty much everything that I wanted to discuss. I'm okay. sure there's going to be many people listening that have, um, that are, that, that something's rung true with them mm -hmm. or there's got a lot more questions. Um, is there anything firstly that you felt was, was suitable that you'd like to. In terms of what helps or. Anything regarding maybe a common question that, that you're asked as an ADHD therapist. Sure. I mean, 
I think the the most common question that I get asked after after a diagnosis is, okay, what now? Okay. And the most common question I get asked before a diagnosis is, yeah, what difference does it make? And to me, they're the same question. That what you do is, the diagnosis gives you a framework. You know, and where they, would they go for that diagnosis? So typically, um, if you're going through sort of NHS, you'd go to see your GP and tell them that you think that you uh, have ADHD, for mm -hmm. example. Um, they may have a sort of an introductory conversation with you, but it really depends on the, the GP's familiarity with it. Uh, they will then refer you to a psychiatrist who will give you an evaluation. Uh, there's some pre-evaluation work that you have to do. Uh, it's likely that a family member will be asked to provide some background information. Uh, the issue with that currently is that the waiting list, so we're you know, based where we are, is about 18 months at the moment. And the secondary issue is that if you decide to look for a private diagnosis, for instance, you'll be looking at a wait of between three and six months uh, and a cost of somewhere in the region of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds by the time you've had your consultation, had your follow-up and been prescribed medication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've then got an even further issue. So there have been cases where people who have received diagnoses privately that then get referred back to your GP because to buy medication privately is approximately 90 pounds for a month's supply. It's obviously unsustainable for the vast majority of people. And they're looking for that NHS cost, you know, nine pounds something. Yeah. Uh, and GPs have refused the diagnosis and they insist that you see an NHS uh, psychiatrist. Right. So you're back on the waiting list anyway, after going through that whole process. Um, so it is a complete mess. Um, but there are, you know, there are charities out there. So I do some work with charity ADHD UK mm -hmm. um, and they're very good with a process which is called Right to Choose. I don't know if you know. Yep, I've heard of that. So Right to Choose enables you to sort of, in very simple terms. Take control of your treatment, yeah, really, you, isn't it? You chase down the appointment yeah. yourself. You, you find sort of centers that provide NHS assessments. You book the appointment in yourself and then you go back to the GP and let them know that the assessment is essentially happening at this time and, and they do whatever is going on in the background. Um, there are support groups. So, you know, we run support groups, whether you're diagnosed or not, mm -hmm. uh, which, which are fantastic. They tell you that you're not alone. Um, I, I think the thing is, you know, the diagnosis is important. And I think I, I talk an awful lot with people about sort of that moment of being diagnosed and sort of the emotional journey that starts here. And that's where therapy helps. But what I would certainly want to say to people is start making the adjustments now, you know, diagnosed or not. So your company is called N20 Counselling. Yeah. Um, so does that restrict it to people that are local or do you deliver online? No. Well, um, so my practice began as a private practice based in N20 in, in North London, which is where we are. Um, it has developed into mostly ADHD work. Um, later, well, in not very long, actually, I'm going to be launching uh, ADHDcounseling.uk, mm -hmm. uh, which is an ADHD-specific service. Uh, it will be delivered entirely online. Uh, I'm hoping that it will be a worldwide service, Brilliant. actually. Um, you know, like with many things, the, the sort of the level of healthcare in different countries is, is you know, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, and the cost is, is in, can be incredibly varied, uh, you know, to see a sort of a, someone in my position in the U S for instance, if you wanted to pray privately, you're looking in the region of $300 an hour, which yeah. is, you know, a lot. A, an extraordinary amount of money really. Um, so hopefully that's going to be launching later this year. Um, hopefully the sort of the pages up as, as this comes out. Uh, that's that's the hope, but we'll wait and see. But either way. And when you launch that, would you mind putting it on this YouTube video? Um, just in the comments, that would be really helpful. So how can someone contact you in in, in the interim? Sure. So uh, the easiest way to contact me is either at the website, which is N20 Counselling. Uh, I have reluctantly... Is that .com, .co.uk? Uh, .co.uk. .co .co um, I have reluctantly started uh, Twitter and instagram account <laughs> okay um i am adhd counseling on twitter and adhd counseling uk on instagram um you people can contact me there um there are links to you can whatsapp me text me email whatever you like on the on the website 
Uh, and you know, otherwise you can just Google my name um, and ADHD and I'll, I'll come up pretty quick, I imagine. And your name is David Levy, just to clarify to anyone that's else me. that's listening. Um, if any of you have got any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the comments. I'll ask David to see if he would kindly try and keep his um, eye out on the comments as well. And otherwise I'll try and do my best to try and get those answered for you. Um, David, thank you so much for coming in. Thank Loved you for having it. Me. Really, really informative. And I think that that's um, definitely going to answer a lot of people's questions. So thank you very much for coming no in. Problem. Thank you. Take care. Yes.